welcome to this week's preview show, BBC Radio Solent's Chris Temple is back alongside me as we look ahead to tomorrow's game against Newcastle at Vitality Stadium. Here's what's coming up. We look back at last Wednesday's 1-0 defeat at Molyneux, before our attention turns to that game tomorrow night at Vitality Stadium. Well, we're going to start back at last week and that 1-0 defeat to Wolves. Chris, it, it wasn't quite the result we were hoping for, but certainly a much improved performance. Yeah, it's the sort of, I can see club media accounts uh, tweets right now, not the result we were hoping for, which is one of my most hated phrases. Um, but yes, it was better. Uh, I think most people would agree it was definitely better than Palace, which was obviously uh, something that people would rather forget uh, against a very good team. And we shouldn't forget that Wolves have, you know, they proved already stringing these results together, turning around game after game. They went to Villa and won a, a tricky looking game as well just a few days later, which obviously did Bournemouth a favour as well. So, um, yeah, I think... Uh, Building blocks, of course, at this stage of the season, you don't get points for building blocks. You don't stay up if you play a bit better. You've got to actually score the goals, win the games and actually have some shots, which would be great as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we, I spoke to Lewis Cook after the game and you could actually tell that the players' mood was considerably different than after the Palace game. Um, yes, it sounds stupid because they didn't have a shot and the creativity was obviously not there. And that's the biggest frustration, I think, at the moment. But I think the players felt that all in all, they would actually defended Wolves a bit better. They locked down Traore pretty well. I thought Adam Smith had an excellent game against him at left back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's going, you, you'd prefer it to be better than Palace than worse than Palace, of course. But the harsh reality is no goals in two games, hardly a shot uh, and no points, which at the moment down the bottom is the key factor. But yeah, hopefully, if things can keep moving in an upward trajectory, um, we should hopefully maybe see them crack one or two of those barriers against Newcastle. And obviously, aside from the goal, we spoke before, before the game about the Jimenez Traore partnership. They, they did contain it very well, didn't they? Particularly in the first half. They did, but that has to come with a little asterisk because, of course, those two created the goal that won the game. So, in a minute, you know, or in a second, it takes to, to win the game. It is a cliche. Traore is so difficult to defend in the exact situation that they caused, where he basically brought the ball nearly to a halt and then just exploded out of the blocks like an Olympic sprinter over three or four yards. Boom, he was past the defender. The cross came in. It, obviously, Steve Cook and Jack Stacey, the ball landed between them. They'll look at that and think they could have probably defended it better. But Jimenez powering onto it. You know, the striker always has got the advantage there in coming from deep. He can see everything in front of him. Uh, and it was a fantastic header, which Aaron Ramsdale didn't really have a chance with. So, yeah, I think they, the Cherries talking back, they, they felt they could have maybe stopped it before it had got to Traore and, and dealt better with the free kick. But in that, that's why Traore is so, is so feared, because literally you can click your fingers and boom, he's gone. Um, and his crossing was just... Pretty much every cross that he delivered landed absolutely in the area that someone like Raul Jimenez, um, you know, any number nine would absolutely love. And that's the sort of service I'm sure that Callum Wilson was probably watching from the other end thinking, oh, it'd be lovely to, to have some crosses like that to feed off in the near future. So, yeah, um, everyone knew about the Traore Jimenez partnership, but knowing about it's one thing and actually managing to stop it is another. And Bournemouth aren't the first or the last team to, uh, to find that a struggle. It was also the uh, the first time we'd seen Philip Billing since Project Restart had got underway. What did you make of, of his game? Yeah, well, he seemed to pick up that knock, obviously, in the late in the first half, which sort of hampered him, and it was a shame he couldn't couldn't continue after that. I do think he adds something extra to the to the team. He obviously adds a bit of height to help deal with set pieces as well, and obviously it was his first game back, so I don't think we could expect too much from him in that game. Bearing in mind he got an injury and only played what 40, 47, 48 minutes anyway. So the good news is he sounds like he's shaken that dead leg off. Um, and we'll be fit for, for Newcastle, which is, which is big, um, back in there alongside Jefferson Lerma. And obviously, let's keep our fingers crossed that Jefferson Lerma can get through this last game of the, uh, before the cutoff for, for 10 bookings, because obviously that was why Jefferson got taken off himself at Wolves. In the end, you're thinking, well, you're trying to get back in the game 1-0. You're taking off your, your most energetic midfielder. But actually, Eddie was probably sensible in the, in the grand scheme of things to make sure that having lost Callum Wilson for this Newcastle game, that he didn't Je you lose Jefferson Lerma for the same two games. That was certainly a blow, wasn't it? You know, Callum Wilson picking up that yellow card, I think it was in the first half, and with Joshua King now, you know, recovering from an injury, having Callum Wilson certainly out for the next two games is, is a huge blow. Yeah, I'm not. I'm no. I'm no. I'm no centre forward. But I'm not. I'm not sure he needed to get booked there. I'm not, I, I think that was a, a silly booking, really. Uh, I'm not sure the referee necessarily needed to possibly book him, but I don't think it's a challenge he needed to make. I think he could have put the brakes on. Again, I'm not running at full tilt. I don't have the power that Callum Wilson has. Patricio, the goalkeeper, obviously made a meal of it as well. 
Um, but I think that would be the frustrating thing, that it was a bit of an unnecessary booking, really. Um, how many times have we said that Jefferson Lerma is guilty of unnecessary bookings? And I think Callum should have been possibly a little bit more streetwise there, knowing he was on nine yellows. Um, so, yeah, disappointing for him. He misses, you know, this game is, is massive. United away, obviously, I'm sure every player loves to go and play at Old Trafford. So he'll be, um, he'll be kicking himself about that. And obviously, I'm sure kicking himself that having got himself back into, into shape and the season have got back going, that he now has to sit out the best part of a quarter of the matches that were left. But you're right, it does, you know, create a situation up front where, you know, there's going to be some choices for Eddie Howe to make, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a moment. Dom Solanke, Joshua King's fitness is touch and go. I hear a lot of people tweeting and talking about Sam Surridge. Um, yeah, Sam's a great player that Eddie rates. We've seen you know, little bright glimmers when he's played and come off the bench. He's only played 16 minutes of, of Premier League football. And as we said, I think with Lewis Cook in the past, every player that is not in the team is always rated a lot higher than you know they, they would be if they were in the team. You, if things aren't going well, it's always the player that's not playing that would be the answer. So I think Sam is, you know, he's going to be a great player in the future. He's already making some great strides. It would be a huge gamble to throw him in. I'm sure we'll see him on the bench because he's the next, the next cab off the rank with them, um, with Callum Wilson out. But uh, yeah, I can't see any throwing him in. And just finally, a word on Lloyd Kelly, a Premier League debut. It has taken a year to come. He's been hampered by injuries. Do you think he's someone that we could see feature a bit more in the next few weeks? I hope so. I mean, he played 10 minutes and it sounds stupid to say I really liked what I saw in 10 minutes, but I really did. Um, he got a great long throw as well. I hadn't actually seen him in the flesh because his only game obviously was at Burton um, and I, didn't, I wasn't at that game. So I hadn't seen him play in the flesh. I obviously seen him in training and, um, you know, around and about the place and he's an he's a athletic figure. But I just really enjoyed the way he got down the left-hand side, you know, even away at Wolves who were very well organised and late in the game, he had confidence and uh, the situation that Bournemouth are in, you know, you can make a mistake. He doesn't seem to have that um, sort of effect hanging around his neck. Um, and I just liked, I liked his sort of energy. I liked, the, I liked his, uh, his left foot as well. He played a beautiful ball down the line at one point as well. And obviously, we've talked before about the balance of, of having Adam Smith on the left as a right footer. And sometimes how that just leaves you a little bit unstable with the, with the balance. And the, obviously, Rico down the left-hand side is the more natural left-footed option. I wouldn't be massively surprised to see Lloyd Kelly start a game in the next couple of games. Um, if he's fit, then I think he, I think he brings something to the, to the team and certainly can do. I wonder whether it's been tough on Jack Stacey in the first few games, um, first couple of games back, you know, tiring, energetic efforts up and down. He's been good going forward, maybe a little bit more suspect at the other end. He's had a, a tougher time. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility. We might see Adam Smith go back to, to right back and, and Lloyd Kelly come in on the left at some point. But it was notable that I thought he, he went for Kelly on as a sub over Rico um, at left back late in the game when they were obviously looking to make that change. So, but good for Lloyd Kelly to get on the pitch. And I guess for him, a little bit of a shame that his long-awaited Premier League debut came in front of no fans. But it's certainly a, a day that he'll remember. Well, certainly one to look out for. Now then, next up for the Cherries is a home game against Newcastle. And Eddie Howe has been previewing that in this morning's press conference. Yeah, so we got Josh King with an ankle injury. Um, he had a scan, nothing serious um, to report back. So... He still hasn't trained with us, so he's going to be touch and go for the game. Philip Billing will be fit after his dead leg. We have to act. We have to take control of our situation and of our destiny and get results. It's the only thing. We can't rely on other teams. We can't look at other fixtures. That's all a waste of energy and a waste of time. We just have to, to play the game. Yeah, the whole team have got an opportunity to deliver in, in the absence of Callum. It, um, one person's disappointment is always a, an opportunity for another player, and I so many times throughout history, you've seen that um, be a, a change for someone or a team. Um, I feel we've prepared well for this game. I think we, we've hammered home certain points with the players that we want to improve and, and work on. We've done that. Um, as I said, we have to be um, a lot more creative as a team. We have to be full throttle to, to impact the game right from the start. Well, that was Eddie Howe speaking in this morning's press conference. Chris, given other results last weekend and, you know, games tonight, it's a real opportunity, isn't it, for, for Eddie, Eddie Howe's side to make a statement at the bottom? Yeah, those outside the situation will be, will be saying no one wants to stay up. No one can get a point between them at the moment. And I think that's probably partly the pressure of the situation, um, partly a bit of rustiness, partly the opposition that they've been playing. But yeah, apart from Brighton, who obviously had that 
that amazing win over Arsenal, which is amazing what one result can do. And that's what Eddie Howe, uh, you know, has been, I guess, reiterating in the, all of his interviews that he's done pre and post match so far is that just you're one result away from things turning around. And actually, of course, former fans will be sort of looking through, through their fingers at the fixture list of those coming up after this game. And that is why people are putting so much emphasis on this home game against Newcastle who've got nothing to play for, um, as, as being absolutely massive because the fixture list, Man United, Tottenham, Leicester, Man City, even Southampton at home, you know, um, Southampton are a much better team away than they are at home and they're obviously having a, a bit of a charge at the moment as well. So the next four games, United, Tottenham, Leicester, City, uh, and I think the interesting thing as well is not just to look at those games, but to look at who else, what the other teams have got in those games coming up as well. Now, Villa have got quite a tough run. They've got uh, United, they've got Palace, and then they go to Everton uh, as well. Uh, in fact, they've got Liverpool away as well. So Villa have got a tough run. I think I'm looking at sort of game week 34, which is two weeks on, when Bournemouth are in the middle of this United, Tottenham, Leicester, Man City run. Look at Watford's games. Norwich at home, Newcastle at home, and then West Ham away. West Ham have got Burnley, Norwich and Watford in the same time that Bournemouth have got Tottenham, Leicester and Man City. So that is why people are looking at this game to say, you've got to try and get yourself ahead of the pack here. Because this weekend, Villa have got, uh, sorry, Villa have already played, of course. Um, West Ham go to uh, play Chelsea in this round of games. Brighton have covered, obviously, in a short while, played Manchester United on, on Tuesday night as well. So there's some tough games in this round for other teams. This is why Bournemouth absolutely have to take advantage of this game coming up because there will be a bit of this. There'll be a bit of teams moving up and down, but at the moment everyone's locked together and that is so, is so tight down the bottom um, that even a draw, you know, even Watford's point against Leicester at the moment from that last minute equaliser is enough to keep them out of the bottom three. Um, I think Villa, Villa look like they're struggling. Um, Dean Smith's already started to trot out the sort of fatigue factor and they obviously had to play uh, a bit of a turnaround. I think, I think the physical demands at this stage of the season with the short turnaround everybody's had, uh, that will have an impact. And, and the next four games are actually quite a tight turnaround as well, obviously, because they go to Manchester United on Saturday, then it's Tottenham on Thursday, Leicester on Sunday. And we're still waiting to hear when the City away game will be, but it will be in the early part of that midweek because City have got an FA Cup semi-final the weekend after uh, the Cherries game. So it's going to be a quick four-game turnaround. And again, that's why I think it puts even more emphasis on this game. So, yeah, not to build it up massively, but it's absolutely huge. And speaking of Newcastle, how impressed have you been with the way that they've started back after the break? You know, they've had, had some good results in 3-0 against Sheffield United. I know they had 10 men, but it's, it's certainly a, an impressive result, isn't it, given their form? Yeah, they could easily have got sucked into it, couldn't they? They were in that, uh, that, that group just above the, uh, the sort of bottom six, if you like, and a, a couple of results for teams below them and a couple of bad results for them. And all of a sudden, it, you know, it, could have, it could have sort of got a bit sticky for them. But they've, like Southampton, have eased themselves away just with that one result, really, taking four points from their first six. Obviously, they had a tough, uh, a tough run around against Manchester City in the FA Cup at the weekend. Obviously, they changed quite a few, but there were, there were a few players in there. You think of the spine of the team, the cells, uh, played that game. Isaac Hayden played most of that game as well. Obviously, Joe Linton came on later on. Sam Maximan played most of that game as well. We didn't see Matt Ritchie, of course, who had a role to play uh, down at the Vitality last day, last season. But yeah, so they, they will have had a, you know, a few of those players have got a, an extra game in their legs. They did a lot of running against Manchester City because they didn't see a lot of the ball. So that, I think, will be a factor at this stage of the season. Um, but the other thing about Newcastle, much like Wolves, is deceptively, they've actually got a very good defensive record. Um, they've conceded two goals in their last five Premier League games. So, you know, that is a, they've, they've got a solidity there um, in Lascelles and Fernandez at the back, you know, two big centre-halves. Uh, they like to play, you know, some good football. Sam Maximan's an absolute pest. Um, Joe Linton, obviously, a, a bit like Dom Solanke, really. Yeah, he's got the number nine on his back, but it's a, a struggle for him at the moment to find the goals. So, yeah, um, functional side, play some decent football. Obviously, like always at Newcastle, have off-field distractions with the, the Saudi takeover that seems to be going on forever, which can be used as an excuse as well. But the fact they've got themselves safe gives them a bit of you know, breathing space. And Steve Bruce, you know, I know anyhow, you know, there's big respect for Steve Bruce as well. So it, the danger is they have got nothing to play for. They can come and, and play however they like and, and have, a, have a go. And let's hope they do have a go because that hopefully would help Bournemouth. You mentioned how solid they were at the back there, but also at the other end of the pitch, Rich, Richie's been popping up with goals. St Maximum, he looks absolutely key for them, doesn't he, as well? 
Yeah, so Maxima has been a great signing, to be fair. I remember that game uh, up at St. James's Park earlier in the season when Bournemouth took the lead through Harry Wilson and then, unfortunately, uh, saw it turn around. But so Maxima rattled the crossbar in that game. I think it's still rattling now, even uh, running through and smashing one off the bar. But yeah, he looks an absolute live wire. And again, their overseas recruitment, you know, it's been in and out. There have been some good signings and some bad signings. But you have to say that Sam Maximan would be one of those who, who has been a positive. Um, Almiron, obviously, as well. Uh, and then closer to home, Isaac Hayden had a, had, a, had a good season. John Joe Shelby, I haven't mentioned either. He's one of their, their top scorers with five goals this season. And obviously, uh, Matt Ritchie, who I know spent most of lockdown you know, back down here on the south coast um, with, his, uh, with his family down in Hampshire. So, yeah, he's, he's a popular figure out there. Hasn't played a lot this season, actually, Matt. When you look at the number of games he's played, he's, he's actually had quite a few injury problems this season as well. I'm sure he's a player that, uh, that Bournemouth fans would love to be able to have back at, 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 uh, at the club in, in the time of need because he's always someone who could, with that left foot, make something happen. But it's time for the, the, the post-Matt Ritchie era. It's time for someone like Harry Wilson or maybe David Brooks to, to step up now and, uh, and make sure that somehow Bournemouth can find the performance and the creativity. They need to get those technical players back on song. They need to be making things happen in the final third. In terms of our team news, obviously we've talked a bit about Callum Wilson. He's not going to be available. Joshua King, it remains to be seen whether he's going to play. Philip Billing obviously went down with a, a slight knock and a dead leg at, at Wolves. So there's certainly some decisions to be made around the Cheville squad, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, the way Eddie likes to play, of course, he just plays with the one-up and then the, either the 4-1-4-1 or they've obviously played a different way at uh, or the 4-3-3, if you like, or, which becomes a, a sort of a midfield five away from home. So it'll be interesting to see who, who he chooses in the number nine role. If Joshua King's fit, I would play King as the nine. Um, as we I think we discussed last week, there's enough creative wide players now to flank him. You know, you can have Brooks on one side and Harry Wilson on the other or Stanislas on the other or Dan Juma maybe from the start as well. So there's enough wide options that Joshua King could be released, if you like, from his wide role. Obviously, he's a threat, he's a threat wide. You know, fullbacks wouldn't want to come up against Joshua King, that is for sure. But I just think with the, the struggles that Dom Solanke has had, um, at this stage of the season, a Premier League goal would be massive for him, of course. I, I feel he struggled when he played as a, as a lone number nine um, previously in the past. He probably can do it as a, as a two. We often see him playing in the number 10 role, um, which, you know, he has to come short to get the ball. And therefore, a bit like Joshua King, it does limit sometimes your goal-scoring threat yourself. And Joshua King will tell you, you know, if you look at his goal stats, the amount of time he's played as a number 10, um, he probably has turned out a good ratio for, for goals. So, yeah, if it was my choice and King was fit, which, we, you know, he may well be, we're not sure yet, we haven't heard, um, then I would play him there. I think he, like Wilson, is a nuisance for defenders. Um, but whoever whoever it is, I'm sure Surridge will be on the bench. Lots of people call him for Surridge. I'm sure we'll see him on the bench this time as well. But it, it needs to click from from elsewhere as well. It needs to click from you know Lewis Cook pulling a few strings. It, it needs Brooks to click. It needs Harry Wilson to to maybe step up as well. So yeah, some of those other players um, need to need to make it happen. Absolutely. Well, there's no doubt about it. It is an absolutely huge game at Vitality Stadium tomorrow night. You can log on to AFCB TV and listen to Chris and Willow doing live commentary from the ground. That's all we've got time for today. Make sure you tune in on Friday to catch our preview of Manchester United. Bye for now.